Well, that's helpful. We know where we're supposed to sit. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for joining us and can I thank the Premiers and Chief Ministers for what was once again a very collegiate and collaborative meeting uh, where we work together as the Commonwealth with states and territories and today as well we added local government uh, in the national interest. Uh, today all First Ministers in recognition of our commitment uh, for constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as Australia's first peoples, and also uh, with a voice to Parliament being enshrined in our constitution, uh, re-signed, recommitted, and signed up to a statement of intent to secure a successful referendum in the second half of this year. Uh, on health reform, uh, the uh, National Cabinet has agreed that this is the first priority issue for 2023. We will meet again in late April and consider further measures on top of what we already have been doing uh, as a National Cabinet and the work that different jurisdictions are doing along with the Commonwealth, including noting the $100 million investment in primary care pilots program that we have begun to roll out and the urgent care clinics uh, that will be up and running by the end of this year. Uh, we also noted an update by the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Authority on their work being undertaken by Robin Cruck, uh, looking at uh, health professionals and how we can uh, get more efficiency in the system. Uh, we all understand the challenge that is there for improving our primary healthcare networks, how that interacts with the hospital system. And there's absolutely a commitment to work on policy outcomes as the starting point. What is the right policy? What is the right structure? Uh, rather than uh, looking uh, simply at, uh, at allocation of funds. We know uh, that the key uh, going forward is uh, to better integrate uh, the systems so that patients are what it is all about, better health care. And we know that the earlier the care is provided, the cheaper that care will be as well. And that is uh, a common uh, position uh, which we have, and we'll be prioritising that throughout 2023, uh, again with the, uh, the next meeting being in, in late April. Today we received the Strengthening Medicare Task Force report that has within it really practical measures uh, going forward as well. On energy, the First Ministers noted the recent agreements that have been rolled out with the Rewiring the Nation program of the Commonwealth, a $20 billion commitment we're rolling out in cooperation uh, with state and territory governments. Uh, we know that part of the key uh, to uh, fixing uh, the energy system is fixing the energy grid, bringing it into the 21st century. And that's what the announcements that we've already made in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, and other announcements are coming as well. All about, for example, Snowy Hydro, Great idea, but nice if you plug it into the grid. So is a, a starting point as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the treasurers uh, will be meeting uh, next week, just finalising the details of the National Energy Bill Relief Plan. Uh, this isn't going to be a one size fits all because different states and territories have different systems and starting points therefore as well. Uh, we heard from Pat Turner uh, the lead convener of the Coalition of Peaks uh, came to talk to us about closing the gap. It was a really constructive discussion. Uh, all of the state and territory jurisdictions agreed that uh, Pat Turner would address their cabinets respectively around the country this year to talk about uh, whole of government at the state and territory level responses uh, to closing the gap in service provision. Uh, also as well, uh, we agreed to uh, re-sign uh, the national agreement uh, that uh, was signed in 2020 
Uh, any updates that are required as well, uh, we'll report back on that. Uh, following the tragic events uh, in Queensland uh, that we saw with the, the murder of the police officers, uh, we heard from Premier Palaszczuk firstly about, uh, about, about the circumstances there, but we also, as a result of a discussion that we held last night, uh, agreed to invite the Director General of ASIO, uh, Mike Burgess, along to talk about uh, the rise of right-wing extremism, in particular uh, the so-called sovereign citizens and other issues as well. And we had a high-level uh, national security briefing uh, on that for the Premier and Chief Ministers. Uh, I reiterate that uh, the Commonwealth will always make available our senior national security advisers uh, to state and territory governments uh, to deal with the challenges uh, that are there of keeping people safe and protecting our internal uh, security issues as well right around the country. Uh, it's quite clear that we need to do better in cooperation between jurisdictions when it comes to firearms. That was part of the issue that's been identified uh, in, in Queensland, and we agreed that we'd report back by the middle of the year through uh, the Attorney General's Ministerial Council on uh, the options to implement a national firearms register and it's agreed that that would be a necessary measure. Uh, we heard from the president of the Australian Local Government Association, uh, Councillor Linda Scott, on the national the priorities for uh, local government, uh, in particular the challenges that have arisen because of natural disasters that we've seen uh, in recent times. Uh, tragically, uh, too many of them in too many places uh, around the country, and National Cabinet reaffirmed we value the work that local government is doing uh, on the ground there. Uh, we also had a discussion about housing and uh, First Ministers uh, discussing uh, the National Housing Accord that's been agreed to by the Commonwealth, state and territory governments, the Master Builders Association and uh, other uh, organisations, including how we mobilise uh, funding, including of superannuation funds into the supply of housing. We all know that supply is uh, something that needs to be addressed. In addition, uh, it's noted uh, the improvements that uh, are being made and will continue to need to be done on issues such as uh, affordable and social housing, as well as emergency housing. Um, National Cabinet uh, was very constructive. Uh, we got a lot done today in a relatively short period of time and it is uh, symptomatic, I think, of the way that we have uh, functioned together as a national cabinet, uh, making sure that states and territories have been prepared to uh, uh, put aside uh, their, their own uh, interests in terms of uh, clearly advocating for their states and territories, but also how can we get better outcomes as a nation? And I really appreciate and I want to acknowledge uh, the work and the cooperative nature of state and territories. So I'm happy to, uh, or we are happy to answer questions. Uh, Phil. You promise, just, just on the health issue, look, emergency departments are just in, under dreadful pressure all over the country, here in the ACT and other places, waiting times are massive. Um, is the basic message from today's meeting to people who are spending hours and hours at these places, that's how it's just going to be for the rest of the year? There's no quick fix to this? Not at all. Uh, we're taking action now. Uh, just last week I was in Tasmania uh, signing a, an agreement with Premier Rockliffe uh, for the, the rollout of our, our, our $100 million program. It was $8 million from the Commonwealth, $5 million from Tasmania to make a difference to GP service provision. Uh, one of the, we all agree on what some of the issues are. Part of the issues are people are turning up at emergency departments because they don't have other options. We need to improve primary health care. We need to improve access to GP services. We need to make sure that people who are aged care residents who end up at ED departments can get the care uh, in their aged care residence where they're not 
uh, acute health issues. Uh, we need to work as part of the NDIS process and disability care reform as well. There are many people uh, who uh, end up uh, in hospital who uh, should be receiving services uh, other in, uh, in, in other forms. So the task is uh, to continue to talk about the, the bigger picture reform but also for that not to be, not to sit back and wait. We're investing right now in uh, Perth on Wednesday, very deliberately in the lead up to this meeting, uh, we signed or we called for the expressions of interest for seven urgent care clinics. That's about so that if, um, if uh, your little boy or girl breaks their arm, uh, they don't need to go to an emergency department. There's a, a, a mid-tier, if you like, for urgent care that's not an acute care, that's not an emergency, life-threatening situation, that you can get that health care on the ground. Now, we want all of those urgent care clinics to be up and running by the end of the year. There will be three in WA up and running, up and running by July 1. That's the agreement that we have with, uh, with the WA uh, government. And so we're not, we're, we're not waiting, we are acting, but we're also recognising that these are complex issues that require a uh, whole of governments to provide a solution. Just here, Katina. Um, you said in your preamble there that the strengthening Medicare report that, you, that you've got the, we haven't seen yet, has some very practical measures in it. Are you able to act on any of those measures before you next meet in April, or are they the kinds of things that everyone needs to agree to? Uh, yes, we, we are in, intend to act on them. The, the, the Strengthening Medicare Task Force isn't just uh, the minister going away. It's been worked through uh, in consultation with the, the health sector, and we intend to act. Is there a political impasse between you and the opposition, given that the details that they're asking for are ones that you say will be nutted out by the parliament after um, a referendum, if successful? And if I just, if I can ask the New South Wales Premier a similar question, uh, can you share uh, or, or give some light to um, any lobbying efforts you've done behind the scene with your federal counterparts? Given that, so you're in support of the voice, and we have everyone in support of the voice. There seems to be enough detail for you and your government, but not for the opposition leader. Well, uh, can I say firstly, just my door's open. Um, I'm up for as broad an agreement as possible. Uh, this is a reform that should be above party politics. It has been uh, for state and territory governments. Uh, this is about two things: recognition and consultation recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our constitution, in our nation's birth certificate, and that uh, they should be consulted. There should be a consultative body, that's all, all it is, uh, for matters that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And, and that is what this is about. That is what the referendum uh, vote uh, is about in the second half of this year. Don? Um, look, I don't see it as a political issue. Um, this is a uh, this is an issue that that we agree with in principle, um, and um, it should be above politics. It should be a moment which unite, unites the country, doesn't divide the country, um, and uh, and that's been uh, my position um, from the outset. Can I just ask your reaction to South Australia's um, bid to um, have the Sid Sydney's New Year's cricket test brought to Adelaide? What's your Message about that. <laughs> He's kidding. Uh, as, you know, the, uh... a, a, a five day washed out test in Sydney is much better than a five day test in Adelaide. <laughs> um, I mean, why? Because at the end of it, you've spent, at the, at, at, the, at, at, at the end of it, you've spent five days in Adelaide. Listen, Alan Askus, what, what do you say to that? Prime Minister. There he goes, the collegiate. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, we've got a pretty good track record of hosting major events in South Australia, and it's something that we're pretty keen on. Obviously, we're wrapped that the AFL chose to have the AFL gather round in South Australia over New South Wales. They looked at the evidence and the facts, and they decided accordingly. Um, and we hope that Cricket Australia might one day do the same. 
here, then Mark. Prime Minister, do you agree with the IMF that co-payments and means testing should be introduced to the NDIS to make it more sustainable in the long term? And to the state and territory leaders, you're currently covering about a third of NDIS costs, and that will drop to about an eighth in 10 years unless a new agreement is struck. Are you willing to increase your share of the cost burden for the benefit of the, the scheme and its participants? Look, we are examining the detail and the operation of the way that the NDIS is operating. And clearly, uh, part of that, as Bill Shorten has indicated, is that the cost burden uh, is increasing at an extraordinary rate. Uh, we want to make sure that there's bipartisan support for the NDIS. It was one of the things that uh, the former government I was a part of was very proud to introduce. Uh, but I think there is uh, support across the parliament. Uh, but we will look at ways look at ways ourselves, uh, and certainly we are, uh, of how it can operate effectively to ensure that the people it was designed to support uh, get the support that they need. Are you willing to increase yeah. your share? I think in the first instance we want to see the work that Minister Shorten and the, the new federal government are doing come to its conclusion. Uh, ultimately, all of us, I think, have a shared interest in the NDIS operating the way that it was supposed to. It was properly designed, it was properly funded, uh, and it has not been properly supported for almost 10, 10 years. We've got a new government, uh, the authors, the architects of the NDIS, who are absolutely determined, along with all of <coughs> us, to make it work the way that it was supposed to. Uh, the other thing, too, is we often talk about costs. We should not lose sight of the benefits of this scheme as well. Correct. This is about changing lives and saving lives. And if you want to be completely economic about it, uh, the benefits from everybody being able to reach their full potential and participate to their full extent that they choose to, they flow first and foremost to the Commonwealth Government through income tax and through other, uh, other uh, mechanisms. This is not a cost, it's an investment in being a fair place, a decent place. Uh, and, and I want to congratulate the Prime Minister and Minister Shorten for the leadership they've shown already. And they can count, I think, on all of us as partners. Yeah. Mark? Uh, Prime Minister, and then just, just give us an update on where National Cabinet is on some of the major issues in health reform, 50-50 hospital funding, um, whether the Medicare rebate should be increased, the uh, use of allied health uh, care, pharmacies issuing prescriptions, some of the practical things that mean uh, you know, something substantial to people. Yeah. Um, look, we are, we are working through the issues of the health system and the way that it, uh, it, it operates to make sure that patients are at the forefront. So the starting point of our discussions isn't about dollars and shares of funding. Uh, we just heard an example of the NDIS where there's a different share of funding operating. It is how do we maximise the benefit to patients from every dollar that is spent in the health system. That is, that's the starting point, putting patients at the front of it. Uh, the Medicare Task Force has some really practical uh, reforms uh, that have been adopted today, but so too are the other measures that were included in the October budget, including the primary health care pilots of how that interaction between primary health care and the hospital system can produce better outcomes for patients is what we are doing. Just here. Prime Minister, um, you talk about putting patients at the front and getting patients earlier care to make it cheaper for them. We know that um, bulk billing is on the decline. People are sometimes paying up to $100 just to see their GP. Will you consider uh, increasing the, the um, rebate and Premier Perrette, you said this morning that you wanted today's meeting to culminate in a roadmap to a better national health system. Do you feel satisfied that you've achieved that today? Um, I do. Um, and I think, and it goes to Mark's question earlier as well, um, at the next national cabinet, 
there will continue to be a substantive discussion on the practical measures in relation to better integrate the primary care health system um, and the public health system run by the states and territories. Um, you know, areas like pharmacies um, and giving greater opportunities for medications and, 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 and prescriptions, urgent care clinics. Um, I agree completely with the Prime Minister and I don't think the discussion we had today, it's not about dollars and cents, it's about what is the best health system possible. Let's, let's put patients at the centre of that system integrate the networks in a better and more efficient way and then work out the funding arrangements off the back of it. If you start with funding, you won't get an outcome. And I think today was, in terms of the discussion on a range of issues in, re in respect of that, I think everyone's, everyone here is on the same page. Um, and I think going forward with the fact that healthcare is going to be the number one issue for National Cabinet for the next 12 months, I think we'll bring positive outcomes. Josh and then Michelle. Yeah, uh, PM, uh, you mentioned uh, right-wing extremism and sovereign citizens. Could I ask for an update on the terrorism law reforms that Claire O'Neill has flagged previously. Um, and if I could ask, a, I guess, a more personal reflection, what's your concern specifically about right-wing extremism, extremism, sovereign citizens, and to the Queensland shooting? Do you consider that an act of domestic terrorism? Um, on uh, the work that Claire O'Neill is doing, I'm always cautious to talk publicly about national security issues uh, before they've gone through proper processes. Uh, but that, that work is certainly uh, underway and is substantial. I think the fact that uh, the uh, states and territories uh, last night, this is revealing something that isn't confidential. It came out of, out of the discussion we had last night where uh, Anastasia was, uh, Premier Palaszczuk was due to report today on the national firearms issue. Um, I attended, uh, of course, at the, the funeral service of the victims who were murdered. Uh, it was one of the most uh, moving things that, that I've done in, in my life. And I think that when you have uh, people who are on the front line uh, every day, uh, our police officers uh, murdered these young people, young man, young woman, uh, potentially as well, one other wounded, uh, the, the, the catastrophic, uh, premeditated, calculated murder that occurred there on the basis of a warped uh, ideology uh, then it requires uh, us to do what we can to keep uh, the citizens we all represent safe. And so hence the, the uh, report this morning uh, from uh, Mr Burgess uh, that went into, as a high level briefing, went into details that I won't go into here. Uh, but we know uh, that uh, the threat is real and tragically we've seen the consequences of it. Michelle. Could you give us a flavour, please, please, Prime Minister, of what Pat Turner said and what she puts forward as the most urgent issues that need to be addressed at the moment in closing the gap? Uh, th thanks, Michelle. Well, well, the first thing is that Pat Turner is such a powerful advocate and just a great Australian. Um, the Coalition of Peaks is, of course, a, a, the peak organisation for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander controlled services. And she, uh, like all of us, is expressing uh, concern about the failure of us collectively as a nation to meet the targets that have been set in closing the gap. Um, I said this week, and it was reported as if it was something new that I said that all governments need to do better. All governments. This isn't an ideological issue. Uh, the gap which is there on education, on health, on life expectancy, on, on justice issues uh, in too many areas is not closing in accordance with the targets which are there. But uh, Pat Turner is very determined. Uh, she indicated as well that she sees 
a direct link between constitutional recognition and respect and a voice in achieving better outcomes in the future. And uh, she made the request uh, of uh, state and territory uh, governments that she be able to meet uh, with the respective cabinets because one of the things uh, that she emphasised was that it wasn't just a matter of the the Aboriginal or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs ministers in different jurisdictions. It requires health ministers to be engaged, education ministers, early learning ministers to be engaged in these issues, housing ministers to be engaged as well. She emphasised the importance of, of housing. And hence why I thought it was very pleasing and I hope that, that she was pleased that immediately all of the jurisdictions uh, indicated that they wanted to have meetings of the cabinet uh, addressed uh, by, by Pat Turner uh, in, in the coming year. And it was a very, as much as uh, the challenges are very clear, uh, in my mind, it was also uh, very positive. My, we'll, we'll, we'll take just a couple more and those people who yell won't get, yep, yep. Um, on the audit report into bushfire grants in New South Wales, which are partly federal government funded, do you think that that was the way that disaster relief should be delivered? Do you think, or do you trust the states to deliver such money? And do you agree with New South Wales Labor leader Chris Mims that the matter should be referred to ICAC? Well, I think that disaster relief should be distributed on the basis of need. That's my starting point. And uh, quite clearly, uh, it shouldn't be uh, politicised and my government, in terms of uh, how we've worked with all of the state and territory jurisdictions, has done that. We have provided support uh, across the board, and I think if you look at where it has gone, whether it be uh, in Victoria, New South Wales, uh, South Australia, Western Australia, um, I don't think I've been into a Labor electorate <laughs> in that entire time. Uh, federally that uh, I've been the Prime Minister in making substantial uh, announcements, except perhaps Bendigo um, would be the exception uh, to that. Um, we all have a responsibility to uh, deliver where it's needed, uh, not uh, to deliver politically. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, we made changes uh, in New South Wales and I became Premier in relation to grants allocations to ensure um, that uh, the, the subjective nature of that would not come into play, um, that the funding goes uh, to where the need is, and that's what's most important. And can, I, uh, can, can I just add on that? Well, I was critical as opposition leader with uh, some of the former federal government's allocation in the Northern Rivers region, uh, where uh, some of that allocation, in my view, uh, was politicised, and it shouldn't be. Uh, last one here. Have you been able to use this opportunity to uh, further uh, progress negotiations with Premier Palaget when it comes to the Olympic Games funding? And uh, uh, same question, uh, Premier Palaget, and could I separately ask if you had much response or reaction from your colleagues when it comes to the GP payroll tax issue and whether there's any grace period coming for, for doctors there? Um, on the, the, the first question, watch this space. Uh, Premier Palaget and I are both committed uh, to a very successful uh, Brisbane and uh, Queensland Olympic Games. And I have said before uh, that the Commonwealth was committed to that. Uh, we have uh, worked uh, these issues uh, through. And uh, what I want to make sure, and I have the experience of uh, living, in, living in Sydney, uh, is to make sure that uh, there's not just, it's not just about the event when it happens in that two weeks or, or four weeks. Um, it is about uh, leaving an infrastructure legacy that benefits not just Brisbane, but the whole of Queensland. And I am very pleased uh, with the discussions that I've had with Premier Palaszczuk. And uh, we will um, sometime um, when it's appropriate uh, be making uh, appropriate announcements, but I'm very confident that people will see the Commonwealth and the Queensland Government working together in the interest not just of Queenslanders, 
this is an, uh, an event that will be great for Australia. We have some big events coming up and I'd encourage people as well to bear in mind that the third biggest event in the world is going to be held here in Australia and New Zealand this year, which is the Women's Football World Cup. Only followed, only beaten by the Men's World Cup and the Olympic Games. Third biggest event in the world will be held this year at, a, at, at venues uh, right around the country. That will be uh, an, an exciting opportunity for Australia as well. Anastasia? Yeah, I just want to say that the Prime Minister is a very firm supporter of um, uh, the Olympics in uh, Brisbane and, and across Queensland. So we look forward to um, uh, speaking to everyone shortly about that. And secondly, in relation to the um, amnesty for the uh, GPs on the payroll tax, I raised it at National Cabinet. I said that we are planning and uh, Queensland's committed to doing that amnesty until the middle of 2025. Um, can I also acknowledge the hard work of GPs um, in Queensland? They do extraordinary work and I know that um, they do great work right across the country. Thanks very much. Can I, um, can I just thank everyone? I think we've given every, every outlet a, a, a crack. People do have to get on planes. The Oz have had a crack, sorry. What? What? Oh, right. Oh, well, you moved. Uh, people have got to get a plane. Sorry. If it's for me, I'll take it offline. <laughs> Thank you.